Uh, my apologies. Good evening, everybody. Today is January 20th, 2021. This is joint regular meeting of the Marin City Council and Marin and City Council acting as successor agency to the redevelopment agency of the city of San Bernardino. I call to order this open session uh, beginning tonight and I will ask uh, council member Kim Calvin of the sixth district, please would you, uh, let's all rise. And um, Ms. Calvin, if you would please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag, the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Councilmember Calvin of the 6th District. This time I'll recognize our city clerk to please call the roll. Councilmember Sanchez? Here. Thank you. Councilmember Ibarra? Here. Councilmember Figueroa. Here. Thank you. Councilmember Sherat. Here. Thank you. Councilmember Reynoso. Here. My second meeting is just not getting started. It's supposed to start at seven. Someone is on the line. If you could please mute your mic. Thank you. Councilmember Kelvin. Here. Thank you. Councilmember Alexander? Here. And Mayor Valdivia? Here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. City Clerk. Uh, at this time, uh, Ms. City Attorney, is there anything to report from our closed session? Uh, Mayor, Council Members, and for members of the public, we did have several closed session items this evening. Um, we were authorized to file two receivership cases um, by a unanimous vote of the Council, and that is all the reportable action that I have. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. City Attorney. I want to um, stop a moment and pause. Today is Inauguration Day. Uh, we welcome uh, the uh, President of the United States, Joseph R. Biden Jr., and our Vice President, Kamala Harris. The City of San Bernardino extends our uh, appreciation to certainly the people that we represent, nearly 225,000 people in our city and we know no party. We are all Americans and we want to support the new administration. And on behalf of the city of San Bernardino, we look to unite our community. And um, again, this is a, a very a momentous occasion, especially for our vice president, Kamala Harris. She is our United States, uh, former US um, Senator from the state of California and the first female vice president and so we do extend um, our best wishes to the new administration. And we look to cooperate, we look to participate and we want to um, unite our community. So uh, on behalf of the city of San Bernardino, we pause and reflect on this uh, momentous occasion of inauguration day here in the United States in Washington, DC. With that, Mr. City Manager, would you please uh, provide uh, your report? You're on mute. Thank you. Uh, sorry about that. Um, still getting used to the Zoom era. Um, a few uh, a few things going around the city. I will try to keep this brief because there were uh, we're off to just a slightly slight start um, getting into the in, in the open session. First of all, I want to acknowledge. Uh, and we've already heard some good stuff about Chris Jensen. Um, some really good things that came out of Public Works. It, they they did a really good job of getting ready for the rainy season cleared out a lot of storm drains and, and channels. And we really didn't have much of a problem except for with one storm drain on Rialto uh, Boulevard. But as it turns out, that actually was a or Rialto Avenue. That was clogged with debris and uh, blew the manhole cover off. That was a county facility, not a city facility. So there was some damage done to the street, uh, which the county has acknowledged and is taken care of now. But uh, aside from that, really, uh, we had some pretty major rain events. So Chris, thank you for what all of you and your staff did to get us ready for that. Um, there was, uh, they've been doing a pretty good job also of doing some, uh, mitigation of some, of some illegal dumping along Bobbitt Street. Uh, there were a number of areas that were, uh, affected and we have not only removed it, but are in the process of installing a guardrail to make it much harder for that type of thing to happen. We're going to be embarking on those types of efforts across the city as we continue our efforts to, uh, to clean the city up and present a better, a better face, uh, to, of, 
to uh, to our residents, to, our, to the citizens of San Bernardino. Um, to that end, also we've been running around repairing uh, potholes, and we have addressed, I guess now, about uh, almost 2,100 potholes across the city, and uh, our I think almost every open ticket for those now has been completed. Um, now it's a constant process, a game of whack-a-mole, but we are constantly responding. We have a street crew on duty and they are out doing both cold patch uh, and where appropriate hot patch. Hot patch works better in high traffic areas. Um, so we are busily addressing those types of issues. Um, for the parks department, uh, I should note that the, that the uh, parks department hosted celebrations, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day um, a couple days ago. Uh, and a number of community centers, including um, Ruben Campos, Delman Heights, Wano Creek, Ruben C. Hernandez, and Verdemont. Also the pickleball court at Paris Hill, uh, the conversion is now open. It's giving us, giving our citizens a really good outdoor recreation opportunity, which is extra valuable, of course, now during the, uh, as we continue to fight the pandemic. And uh, uh, also another outdoor recreation opportunity, this one for the for the younger, younger crowd, Hudson Park, the playground build out there, uh, Kaboom. Uh, is completed and open and, and seeing quite a bit of use. Uh, it was funded by San Manuel, by the Los Angeles Kings of the NHL, and by the Los Angeles Galaxy of Major League Soccer. So kind of need to draw that type of attention here from those major sports teams, sports leagues. Um, community economic development. Uh, we have been notified, and this is a really important, that we are the direct beneficiary of a federal grant. Um, to uh, to work to, to provide rental assistance and also eviction prevention. Uh, we're getting $6.4 million uh, for those programs. And um, that's direct, as I said, direct allocation. So we'll be putting that to good work very shortly. Mike Huntley and his team, especially Gretel Noble, will be in charge of that. Code enforcement is working very closely with the city attorney's office, uh, just abated a pretty significant community concern on 16th Street. It was a dilapidated old structure that has now been removed. Uh, in cooperation with the property owner. Um, animal services, we can't go without mentioning animal services at least once a meeting apparently. Uh, they rescued a husky named Gray. He was in a storm drain. This made, it's got national media attention, um, was stuck in a storm drain and uh, together with the fire department, they were able to extract the husky. He went, he came out a little dirty, but ended up quite a bit cleaner because they had to use a dishwasher, a dish detergent to, to grease him up and get him out of there. So he came out not just healthy, but a little bit cleaner than he was when he went in. Um, and finally, libraries. Um, we are, again, providing some services out of our libraries, a lot of it remotely. Uh, literacy staff is doing the app, is providing after school homework help on Zoom for students uh, kindergarten through eighth grade, uh, Fridays from 1 to 3.30. And they're also offering an additional hour from 3.30 to 4.30 uh, when, uh, for homework assistance when it's, when it's needed. Uh, and BrainFuse is doing live homework help. It's available via the, li via the uh, library's website, uh, www.sbpl.org. Uh, tutoring assistance uh, together with chat on, uh, with subject matter experts uh, from one to 10 almost every day of the year, uh, except on major holidays. So import another important service being brought to you by a, a city department uh, to our residents, especially you know, the kids who are school-age kids who are going through uh, tough times right now. Um, so with that, uh, Mr. Mayor, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to share the good news uh, about what's going on around town. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. City Manager. And I want to send my deep appreciation uh, to all of our public employees in the city of San Bernardino. We thank you, all of our directors. Very good reports we're hearing. Um, finally, I, I do want to stop and uh, pause and recognize um, on this past Monday, our City Hall uh, recognize the contributions in life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And um, our City Hall was uh, closed in honor of him. And we had various community activities throughout our city. And uh, we wanted to um, certainly pause and remember his contributions, um, his uh, leadership in the civil rights movement made some very um, indelible impressions for the road ahead for all Americans and really for the world. With that, uh, let's move on to the uh, appointment portion of tonight's uh, calendar. We have five appointments for um, commissioners. I will read their names and um, then Miss City Clerk, if we could uh, swear them in, I, I'm imagining they'll go into your office, is that right? 
the mechanics of that. Um, so tonight we will approve them and then um, we encourage um, these uh, um, individuals to please um, seek out our city clerk and she'll um, have you um, sworn in and the appropriate uh, signatures on your document and certificates. We wanna send our appreciation to our community members uh, for their um, spirit of cooperation, volunteerism in our community. We thank you for offering your name and candidacy for these uh, positions. The following five individuals, Mr. Robert Porter, the Arts and Historical Preservation Commission representing Ward 7, Mrs. Deanna uh, Cervantes to the Public Safety and Human Relations Commission representing Ward 7, Ms. Faye Eldridge of the Parks, uh, I'm sorry, to the Parks Recreation Community Services Commission representing Ward 7, and the reappointment of Mr. Savage to the Charter Review Commission representing Ward 7, and finally, the appointment of Mr. Michael J. J. Gallo to the Measure S Citizens Oversight Committee representing Ward 4. Can I um, invite a mo motion for um, approval? Move approval. Move to approve all five. All right. There's a motion and a second. Thank you. And Ms. City Clerk, if you please call the roll. Councilmember Sanchez? Yes. Councilmember Ibarra? Yes. Councilmember Figueroa? Yes. Councilmember Shura? Yes. Councilmember Reynoso? Yes. Councilmember Kelvin? Yes. And Councilmember Alexander? Aye. Okay. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. City Clerk. Moving on to the uh, presentations of tonight's City Council and uh, our apologies for starting a few minutes late, public. Thank you for your patience. Uh, this is the public safety update. Uh, Mr. City Manager, um, I'll turn it over to you and you can uh, designate the staff on that update. Yes, as has been requested, um, we have uh, we asked the police department there uh, in response to community concerns in particular um, and council concerns regarding uh, the uptick in violent uh, crime in the city uh, to provide us with an overview of what uh, what the status is um, and uh, uh, give a sort of broader overview of how things are going in the community. So with that, I will turn it over to Interim Chief McBride. Good, e good evening, evening, Mayor and City Council. If I could put up the, uh, the PowerPoint, please. I'm here tonight to provide you an update on the 2020 end of year report for the police department. Uh, it's been a challenging year. It's been a challenging year for everybody, both in the community and across the country, uh, particularly in the police department. And we've uh, seen new challenges in how we provide policing to our community, which uh, we've overcome in many cases and, and changed our uh, some strategies, but I think, uh, It'll bear out to see that we have been pretty successful in doing some of the things that we need to do to mitigate crime. Go to the first page, please. So we'll jump right to the statistics for last year. Keep in mind that the, the part one UCR crime stats are projected for 2020. Uh, they may change very slightly, uh, but for the most part, they're going to be the numbers that you see right there. Um, as you see, homicides are up 56%. Um, and and the two I wanna highlight is, is homicide and aggravated assault, which are both up significantly. But then again, you look at every other type of crime in the city and they're down substantially. And that is really mirroring what we're seeing across the country. Uh, cities have seen significant increases in violent crime. We'll talk a little bit about what we think that relates to or what is causing that, uh, but also seen a significant decrease in property crimes. So in a, Small note, we, what we've seen is a 15% increase in violent crime this year, or 2020 over 2019, but we've seen a 26% decrease in property crime with an overall decrease in crime of 16% across the city. So also I wanna point out that when we started to see the uptick in violent crime in 2020, it really mirrored the lockdowns of the COVID-19 in the state and it started happening around March. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So. Obviously, we've had some concerns about violent crime in the city. We'll talk about what we're doing to mitigate that, um, how successful we have been at targeting those um, things that might be triggers to, to, uh, for homicide, and also what we think is causing a homicide increase in our city. So next slide, please. So this is kind of like talked about where across the country, we're seeing a significant increase in violent crime. And these are just some cities that you see along the right side of the screen that are seeing significant increases and it runs the gamut. When you actually look at San, the city of San Bernardino, we're about the 15th, 16th largest city in the state of California, but we're also right there about the 100th largest city in the country. 
So we tend to think of ourselves as a small city, but when you look across the country, we're actually bigger than cities in a lot of other states. Um, so there was a survey of the uh, major cities chiefs association, and they found that uh, of the 67 major cities surveyed, 84% in, reported an increase in homicides in 2020. And those are significant increases. Even our neighbor in Redlands, which I think a lot of people consider a sleepy city, saw a 500% increase in their homicides. Granted, those numbers are small to begin with, but that's a huge increase for that city. Um, the Police Executive Research Forum also surveyed police chiefs and they asked, hey, what do you think are the triggers or what do you think is causing this significant increase in homicides? And in many cities, they're seeing a 10 or 20 year high um, in homicides. So cities haven't seen these increases, these homicide numbers and violent crime um, for the past 20 years in many cases. And that's pretty much what we're looking at. We haven't seen a number this high and I've been here in the city for 30 years. We haven't seen this in about 20 years. So it's mirroring that trend across the city. But a lot of people are talking about the chiefs that the uh, pandemic has placed uh, people under tremendous stress with the lockdowns. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, what's precipitating some of our homicides in the next slide. Um, we also seen an early release of inmates uh, to avoid COVID-19 epidemics among staff and inmates in jail. So what we're seeing is uh, every week, not a week goes by that I don't get an email from the state of California um, providing names of people who are getting expedited releases from state prison. So the, obviously the state is concerned about COVID in the prison system. So they're depopulating the prisons and they're releasing people back early onto the streets of, of the state. Um, likewise, the county jails are also having those same concerns. A lot of the jails and the state prisons are under court ordered mandates to reduce their populations. So that's really causing a ripple effect that we see across the community where we are arresting people and we'll talk about arrest numbers in a few slides, but we're arresting people at a, at a pretty good pace for viola violating crimes in our community, but they're being released very quickly. Um, sometimes the same day for offenses that they typically would have remained in jail until they went to court. Um, so much so that uh, when our VIP program, our, our folks that go out there in the field and our contractors to talk to these, these individuals who try to prevent them from being engaged as either a suspect or a victim in crime, that uh, they're not so willing to participate in programs because they feel that there's no repercussions for their actions if they do commit the crime. Um, and then the criminal justice system has been significantly slowed down due to COVID-19. There was a period where there was zero bail, the courts have been shut down, they're uh, running a, a skeleton crew, so to speak. Uh, very little trials are going um, forward. I think even if you look at the federal system, um, they haven't had very many criminal cases, definitely no civil cases in federal court in Riverside um, anytime in the, in the recent past. And then of course, I talked about the zero bail policies, which has been bannered about in California for quite some time, but we really saw that um, what that would look like in the state uh, earlier last year when the state instituted that. We saw a lot of folks who would be arrested and released without any bail back onto the, into the community. And uh, I think that is causing some of the, uh, the issues that we're seeing on the streets. Next slide, please. So uh, of course we uh, investigated 69 incidents that were classified as homicide. That number could change. Sometimes we have death investigations that uh, later after an autopsy are ruled to be homicide, but then also cases that go before the district attorney's office where we've arrested somebody, they might find that it's uh, justifiable and it no longer becomes a homicide. Um, and that comes off. So that number does fluctuate. It won't really fluctuate very much, maybe one or one in one direction or the other. But of the 69 total homicides that we saw in the, six, uh, in the city, 59 of them, uh, a firearm was used. That's a significant number. Uh, we'll talk about uh, firearms in the city and what we're doing to get them off the streets. Uh, 65 of the victims were male, uh, four were victims, uh, four were victims of were female. Um, and one thing that we're really proud about, one of the things that we need to do to demonstrate to the community that we're doing our job is that we have a 75% clearance rate. Basically, that means that we've identified the suspect, the case has been submitted to the district attorney's office and a case and the charges have been filed. The national average on clearance is 61%. So we're by, by far exceeding that national average. Um, of course, we'd love to have that 100%, but sometimes we get those whodunits that uh, we have to invest a significant time into. Um, and regardless of who the victim is, um, every homicide is investigated to its fullest, um, and we follow every lead that we can to solve those. I think it's important for, um, uh, for the victims and the victims' families to, that justice is served, and, and if someone is victimized, that we, we go to the fullest extent to solve that crime as we can. Next slide, please. 
Now, these is some, this is some data that we've, uh, by looking at the investigations, we kind of said, hey, what, are, what is causing these homicides? What precipitated the act where a homicide was committed? And the number one thing that we have seen is that it was basically a verbal dispute. Uh, what we're seeing is a lot of people that are being in closer contact with each other. Maybe people are finding out they don't like their neighbor so much and that they're seeing them on a much more frequent basis and there's uh, disputes, but it's also the anxiety and uh, that's being out there in the community that people just don't have any certainty. Maybe they're out of, uh, out of work. Maybe they're um, you know, having some issues because of the COVID and the lockdowns. Um, five were domestic violence related. One was a child abuse case. Three involved a robbery or carjacking. Uh, seven was involved with narcotics. Um, only 11 that we can directly relate to um, it being gang related. Now there is a significant uh, differentiation between someone being a gang member and the crime being motivated by a gang. Um, just because someone happens to be a gang member doesn't mean they did it on behalf of the gang. And that's important, an important distinction. But uh, what we don't see is that we don't see um, to, to a large extent um, gang on gang violence right now. Uh, that is not uh, the case. Um, it's surprising that we see so many of our homicides directly related to verbal disputes. And they just elevate to the point where someone pulls a gun. And what we'll see in a, in a future slide is that there are just a lot of people out there right now in the community carrying guns. Um, and we're taking a lot of those guns off the streets. So. Uh, it's six of the homicides were related to an illegal marijuana dispensary. And then 16 of the cases, um, we just don't have a motive at this time. So that kind of talks about what is, what is going on with our homicides and how we're getting to that. Next slide, please. So as I talked about previously, the early release issue has been a problem for us. Um, there are a lot of people on the, out on the streets that would normally have been locked up. Matter of fact, uh, it's amazing to see the sentences that have been handed down to folks and then seeing that they only do a very little bit or a fraction of the time that they were sentenced to. And it's a lot of it has to do with COVID. A lot of it has to do with uh, what we're seeing in the state and the changes in the laws with prison reform. But we're seeing a lot of these people come back onto the street. And what's interesting to note, um, and how does that manifest itself? Well, of our 69 homicides, we can definitively say that 19, whether they were a victim or a suspect, had been released from prison early. So those are 19 individuals that, if not having been released from the from prison early, uh, would have been locked up and not been on the streets of San Bernardino and then not therefore not have been either a victim or a suspect in a homicide. Um, and these just as policies, these are implement these are affecting us uh, on violent crime across the board. And it's something that we have very little control over. You know, when you have to look at the criminal justice system and what is the role of the police department, it, it, you know, the role of the police department is to, you know, prevent criminal activity from occurring. And that could be from a, just our presence out there in the community, but also following up and arresting individuals who commit crime. Um, we are arresting people at a pretty good uh, clip or number. Uh, the police officers are out there. They're taking a lot of guns off the street. Um, they're doing their job. However, with especially with the, uh, the COVID-19 lockdowns and stuff, the, the rest of the criminal justice system, to some extent, is failing us. And so we're seeing a lot of people who otherwise would have served time in, in an institution are being released. And, and very quickly, in some cases, there's plenty of uh, evidence out there and, and news stories that point to individuals being arrested in the morning, um, being released a couple hours later, and being arrested later in the day. And we're, we're also seeing that here in our community. Unfortunately, uh, people are just seeing that, hey, I'm not going to jail, and there's no consequence for my actions. And, and in many cases, because the court system is operating on a skeletal schedule. Um, they're not seeing, you know, court cases coming up, and they think that um, nothing's going to happen to them. And unfortunately, um, when the courts do get going, the backlog is going to be so great that it might be a significant time before they ever see themselves involved in the criminal justice system. So, next slide, please. So, we are being very proactive. Obviously, we want to prevent crime and we want to suppress it. Uh, but we're using data-driven proactive patrols. We do have officers out specifically on overtime. There are officers that work patrol and they respond to calls for service, but we are putting officers out there to, you know, based on our data um, and putting officers out there to, on directed enforcement to, to prevent criminal activity from occurring. Um, also the district resource officers are out there. They're, they're observing what's going on in their districts and they're doing proactive things. We also wanna you know, prevent crime. 
our investigative teams have been very good at solving crime and getting people um, filed on and getting them off the streets if they've been uh, offending and committing crime in our community. And we've seen a, a significant, a significant increase in our homicide solvability rate. Uh, that's important. So people know that they're, they will be held accountable if they come to San Bernardino and don't commit crime. But we're also intervention. We want to make sure that we prevent crime from occurring in the first place. But we have the violence intervention program. Um, earlier in the year, 2020, we did hold our first uh, call in. It was pretty successful. We had a good, significant show up. Unfortunately, the, the next month, uh, COVID-19 hit, and we couldn't have those in-person meetings, which really are a critical element to that violence intervention program. Um, we hope to, as soon as we can, to get that rolling off the ground again. But that being said, our contractors are still out there in the community. They're still doing community outreach to individuals who are most at risk of either being a victim or a suspect to try to prevent or intervene before those crimes actually happen. And then, you know, we're engaged in community outreach, and you'll see a little bit of that community outreach and how we're doing that uh, in, a, in a couple slides. Next slide, please. So this is where I talk about, you know, our successes in taking um, guns off the street and how much so that has really, really gone up. So, of course, our special investigative units want to reduce the occurrence of criminal activity and really have kind of, you know, we, as a police department, you know, our resources are limited in what we are able to do. So we really have to make sure that what we do is the most effective that we can. So we do a lot of uh, data-driven uh, additional patrols and high visibility patrols in vulnerable areas and work with VIP. But where that has manifested itself, especially when you go back to that, that statistic that shows you how many of our homicides were committed by firearms, you look down at farm recoveries and the huge increase from 2018 to 2020. So in 2019, we saw 747 um, firearms taken off our streets. Last year, we said we saw 854. And how that manifests itself in arrests is that in 2019, we had 413 arrests for uh, weapons uh, arrest or violations to 586, a significant increase. So we're targeting those individuals. And these aren't just people who have guns. These are people who illegally possess firearms. They could be prior felons. They could be committing a crime with that firearm. And we're really targeting it on that, uh, that violent crime and that weapon that is used to commit those crimes. Chief, at this time, uh, let me interrupt. Um, let's take a quick recess. Uh, we're having some issues with the IEMG telecast. So let's take about a five minute recess, please. And we'll continue um, the city council presentation. Uh, that'll give and enable our IMG crew to get back on um, video streaming. So we'll take a five minute recess. And if council members could please report back in five minutes, thank you. A brief recess due to some technical difficulties in our IT department. Ms. City Clerk, um, um, floor is yours on the update on our television coverage as well as recording. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Apologize, we're having technical difficulties on our end with the streaming to the website. However, IMG has recorded the meeting up until the point where we stopped, and that will be added to the website tomorrow, um, That and it will be viewable by the public. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Uh, City Clerk. At this time, we'll proceed back into um, our San Bernardino Police Department's presentation and our um, Interim Chief, uh, Eric McBride. Sir, please continue. Thank you. If we could go Mayor, back. May I just make one note? This is City Attorney Carvalho. Um, there has been a, an inquiry about the availability of the PowerPoint. So I was wondering if there is a link for the members of the public and even members of our council to access the PowerPoint, okay. if, if that can be provided. Thank you. All right. If Miss City Clerk could please follow up and uh, post that up, um, or we'd, we'd make that document uh, available. The PowerPoint um, presentations were posted early this afternoon and when they were emailed to the mayor and city council. And the link is on the cover page of the agenda. All right, let's let's uh, let's proceed into our presentation. Um, mayor. Council member Barra, please. Yes, now, um, Ms. City Clerk, the concern here is the presentations for a while, they are not included in the agenda packet. And this one in particular, for example, was not in the agenda packet. I'm looking at the full agenda packet and it wasn't in there. It was just a one pager. And that is what the audience is looking at. 
I know you sent us the link, send it to us, but this has to be included with the agenda packet. It's a collaborative effort in attempting to get these PowerPoint presentations ready for the meeting. I know that okay. staff is focusing on preparing the staff report and the backup. Um, I, and so it takes a bit more time to prepare the PowerPoint presentations for the meeting. And that's why sometimes they're not including with the packet. However, we do post them online at the same time that I provide them to the mayor and the city council um, and they're viewable on the on the city's website and each the link is always included on the cover page of the agenda for the public's review. Okay, I'll, I'll, okay. I'll just talk to our city manager offline. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let's uh, let's proceed back into um, session, please. And uh, once again, we'll continue. This is slide number nine or 10, I think we are. This is the correct one. Okay, all right, so please. I want to go back into the uh, weapons seizures, an important thing, a, a phenomenon that we have been seeing, and not only us, but uh, a lot of other places across the country are unserialized uh, handguns, or what's commonly referred to as ghost guns. And these are basically um, kits that aren't assembled, that need a minor amount of machining um, to be made into a functional firearm. And because they're not actually a firearm, is they're very... There's really no regulation um, at the federal level uh, regarding these types of, uh, of weapons or kits. And uh, we've seen an explosion in our community of these types of weapons. So in 2018, we, we came across one of these ghost guns, unserialized firearms. In 2019, we saw nine. And in 2020, we seized 112, which was 13% of our overall seizures of, of firearms in our community. So, you know, there are a lot of common sense um, laws that get passed to keep uh, firearms out of the hands of illegal um, people who, you know, aren't supposed to possess those uh, firearms. But oftentimes the people who, you know, illegally want to use firearms find a way. And this has really been a way that they have found that they can order these basically uh, online and have them shipped to their house. And then they do a, a minor amount of machining and they have a functional firearm. And we've seen these uh, really invade our community um, in a large number this last year. And I know that there is some future uh, potential federal legislation that's being looked at uh, to regulate these types of farms, but right now uh, there really isn't. So next slide, please. One thing that we saw a significant increase in in 2020 was traffic fatalities. So in 2019, we saw 48 um, traffic fatalities. In 2020, we saw 62. And we really took a look at that. And I want to highlight that uh, Sometimes it takes up to a year to get the toxicology back on fatal traffic collisions, especially on those that uh, don't have any criminal prosecution involved. But of those 62, 18 involved pedestrians, many of those being um, hit and run accidents. But I wanna take a look at it and see how many of our traffic fatalities uh, involve the, uh, the ingestion of illegal substances or legal substances, just in excess like alcohol or marijuana. And uh, of those, fatal traffic collisions involving pedestrians, we had the toxicology back a number of them and eight of them were under the influence. Um, three of the drivers that hit auto peds were under the influence. Some of those, many of those fled the scene were hit and runs. But so far of those 62 traffic fatalities that we've had this year, we definitively know that at least 33 were under the influence of, of various different drugs. Um, the leading drug was, or, uh, was alcohol was 17. Um, and then what we see an increase in is really marijuana. Um, 11 traffic fatalities, people were under the influence of marijuana. One thing that we're seeing right now is a lot of people using inhalants. Um, and we've actually had fatal traffic collisions where the individual still has the can that they're inhaling in their hand while they're sitting behind the wheel, dead behind, uh, behind the wheel, so to speak. And so we've seen that huge increase. So how are we trying to counter that, um, that usage of you know alcohol or other drugs and while people are driving is that we have actually gone out there and, and had a significant increase 100 in fact 119 percent increase in our dui arrests so you saw in 2019 on the screen that we had 257 arrests for driving under the influence and that number increased in 2020 to 564. so we are going out there we're doing a lot of enforcement you know a lot of uh, dui checkpoints the saturation patrols and we're really targeting um people who are out there who are driving intoxicated, that's a real driver. And, you know, when you talk about 
um, you read a lot of the reports and, and people are talking about that drug use is up significantly, especially during the COVID-19 lockdowns. And we're really seeing that manifest itself in the people that are driving um, intoxicated in the community. And so we're really targeting that. We're trying to, to knock that number down and make sure that those people that are driving out there intoxicated are getting arrested and taken off our streets. Um, and we're being pretty successful. So uh, while that number seems to be high for, DU, for uh, traffic fatalities, uh, we're hitting the driving force on that uh, right where it needs to be. And we've seen a significant increase in arrests. And I want to point something out. The uh, success and the hard work of the officers is the number of arrests that 564 is the highest number of DUI arrests that we've had in the last 15 years. So it, we really are out there doing what we need to do to, to uh, get out there and, and knock that number down. Uh, unfortunately, uh, while we're still going through this COVID-19 uh, lockdown, I think we're still gonna see a significant number of people under the influence, especially with the fact that uh, you, know, you took drug possession, which used to be a felony down to a misdemeanor. It really takes that stigma away from drug usage and that we're seeing a lot more people on the streets who are under the influence by evidence by the number of uh, fatal traffic collisions involving pedestrians, um, but then also the number of DUI arrests. Next slide, please. So, you know, early last year, or last year was our first full year where we incorporated community policing. And we really talked about what the benefits of that were and, uh, and how that was going to make us a better police department. And what the benefits were is it created a greater oversight. We did increase the number of supervisors and managers, uh, which increased the accountability to the community because we make sure that those supervisors and managers are out there ensuring that our workforce is doing the job that they're getting paid to do. Um, we also make sure that, uh, that we're out there pursuing every grant opportunity that we can, which we'll talk about in a couple slides. Um, matter of fact, our, one of our biggest grants was because we adopted the community policing model. Um, and also what's important, and I think really important that we've heard complaints about in our community when we didn't have community policing was that there really wasn't an equitable distribution of resources across our city. Um, some areas, because they had um, influence, uh, were able to generate better services in their area um, than others. Um, and now that we see that every district in the city has the same number of district resource officers, that we're seeing a lot of equity in the community for everybody. Um, and it gives us some pro, you know, opportunity to do some proactive policing stuff. But really where that increased oversight and greater accountability has manifested itself where you can see in the numbers is our response times. So we've seen uh, our response times improve across the board from priority E, which is an emergency type call, all the way down to priority three. And you can see you know, a 19% reduction in priority E a uh, 7% reduction in priority one, 22% two, and 8% in priority three. And that's in, you know, those numbers are in minutes when you see the middle and the uh, one in, under 20, 2019. So that's where we're getting to calls quicker. And I think that's what people want to see. When you pick up the phone and dial 911 or, you know, call our administrative lines, you want to be able to see an officer there as quickly as possible, especially when you're calling under a, an emergency situation. And we're getting there quicker, which is, uh, I think, a benefit of going to community policing with greater amount of supervisory and management oversight. Next slide, please. And you know, those uh, district resource officers are out there. There's 10 of them, there's two in each district. They're free from responding to calls for service. And it's their responsibility to go out there and look at problem areas and chronic service drains in their part of the, uh, the city and deal with those. And these are just the 10 officers. Uh, previously under the quality of life program we had, we had five officers who worked as a team that pretty much spent their time in one or two areas of the city. Um, now we're seeing these just resource officers equitably distributed across the city in every district. And these are the, the numbers that they put up for 2020. So they made 484 human trafficking arrests. We've really targeted down on that and they participate and assist in those uh, programs in their districts. Um, they've made over 2000 misdemeanor arrests, over 700 felony arrests. Um, they go out and contact the uh, the homeless population and try to provide and provide them um, information on, on resources that are available to them. I think it's important for all of us to get those people who are unhoused off our streets and into services. And these officers are the front lines of that of providing um, information and resources to those individuals to get them off the street. Now, one thing I wanna highlight in the transient camp cleanup and also illegal dumping is not just the police department alone. Public Works has a huge part of that and we can't do that 
and get that done, obviously, without the, the, the assistance of public works and their crews who go out there and actually clean up. But a lot of times it's our district resource officers who identify those illegal dumping and, and transient camps. And they go out there and assist and provide security for our public works folks to make sure that nothing happens to them. But I have to thank them. They do the, the line, the heavy lift on those cleanups. Um, and it's a team effort there. Um, public engagement, they go, they've gone out to over a thousand um, contacts with different community type programs in our community. They've contacted over 8,000 citizens in our city. Um, that team alone, it came with the other numbers we have, they collected 85 of the farms that have been taken off the street. And they've also gone out as they identify illegal dispensaries or internet cafes, which are essentially gambling halls. Um, they go out there and do the initial contacts and serve those individuals with the paperwork to let them know that it's illegal and start that process going. Um, they've gone out to 294 separate types of dispensary checks. Um, obviously, that's their responsibility to, to, uh, to take that on, and, and they've been doing a good job about, with that. Next slide, please. So these are the uh, arrest numbers uh, in, for 2020 over 2019. And there's an important thing. While you may look at, like, uh, for example, the book numbers, that's where someone is actually taken to jail and, and booked into the county jail versus being given a citation in the field. With COVID-19, um, the county has asked us, in most cases for misdemeanors to site release an individual instead of bringing them to jail. The reason for that is that the uh, because of the COVID restrictions in state prison and county jails, the state prisons are not accepting any prisoners from county jail that have been convicted and sentenced to state prison. So those are being housed at the county jail, which then they're also capped by court on how many prisoners they can have, which means that they essentially have to release people um, that are the lowest risk immediately. Uh, to keep their populations down. So while we do see some decreases in booked um, individuals, we are seeing increases in cited individuals. But uh, total arrests are down um, over a thousand. But then you have to take into account that total crime to court re uh, reported because we actually have overall crime decrease. Um, the decrease in crimes is 1800, but we're still only uh, arrested 1200 less. So we're going out there, um, if you really look at it, we're arresting more per capita as far as the crime goes than we have in the past. So the officers are doing their job. We're, the police department is, is working very hard to get those individuals that are, that are committing these offenses and victimizing our community arrested and into the system. Unfortunately, a lot of times they're not staying there. Um, as I mentioned before, there's plenty of instances where individuals um, stole a car in the morning and then steal two more later in the day when they get out of jail. And that's unfortunately the, the side effect of a lot of the, uh, the policies and decisions that are made, being made outside the city of San Bernardino. Um, they're outside of our control. And so uh, uh, that's one thing to think about um, later. Next slide, please. Um, so we're very proud of our uh, community engagement. Um, we do have a community affairs office that is very active on social media, I'm sure. And I hope that most of you follow us on one of our platforms, whether it's Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. And we've really used um, some analytics to determine what people look at, what people are interested in. And because of that, we've increased our viewership of our social media platforms by over 1,000%. Um, and so, we're, and we're also working on a mobile device, mobile application to further that community engagement. And we can put all, out all kinds of information out to the community. Uh, for example, we look at 2019 over 2020, uh, 2020, uh, we put out 26 videos in 2019, 40 in 2020. A lot of these are informational stuff. What is it, uh, you know, where can you park? Where can you, what's a violation of the law and in, in, in whatever new crime that's come up or new uh, law. And so across those videos in 2019, we had 94,000 views, but you flash forward to 2020. And because we're engaging the community in a way that they're interested in, we've had over a million views of our videos that we put out to the public. And that's a huge, I mean, there are very few cities out there around us that are so engaged in using these platforms to deliver information out to the community. Um, and then you look at our social media followers from 2019 to 2020, and we've increased those followers across the board on all platforms that we use. So that's the way we can get out, uh, whether a street is closed, whether, um, you know, there's far to report fireworks, illegal fireworks, or anything that we want to put out there. And I think it's really um, helping the community understand what's going on out there. Next slide, please. Um, recruiting. Um, one thing that we, you know, that's kind of 
suffered a little bit. Uh, we were very aggressively in going out there and recruiting, but uh, COVID caused a hiring freeze um, in the city for a short duration. But then there's also been several academies. We utilize both the Riverside County Sheriff's and the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Academies to train our new recruits. Uh, there were several academy classes that were canceled. Um, and so that was an issue. And, uh, and then also because of some grant funded positions, we added 15 new positions. So what's important to look at is at the bottom, um, because you split fiscal years, originally we were authorized 254 officers. We're now at 268. And we at end of the year 2020, we had 247. So, but what I really wanna highlight on that, and I'll hit more on the grants in a moment, but of that 20 positions, 20 of those six, 268 positions are grant funded. We've been very, very aggressive in pursuing grants. And so we've actually been able to augment the police department by 20 sworn positions by virtue of us being very aggressive in pursuing grants. And that's huge because that aren't positions that are being paid out of the general fund, but being paid by the federal or local or state governments. And, and, those, and, that's, and that's great, that's huge. So next slide, please. Of course, we, you know, recruitment's always challenging in some respects, but uh, we do have some community recruitment teams. Um, we have engaged the community um, coaches and other individuals out there that to go out there and commute, uh, recruit for us. Um, obviously, we're interested in diversity. I want to point out that um, for the first time, I think, ever, um, the demographics of the department now the majority, the biggest majority of the department is made up of Hispanic officers at 49%. Um, but that's a reflection of our community. I think San Bernardino is roughly about 60% Hispanic. And I think uh, it's about 70% uh, or so of the um, hires in the last two years were Hispanic officers. But that is what we're seeing as the largest percentage of our applicants to the community, uh, from the community in the police department. A lot of those individuals have uh, local connections to the city. Um, and, and we've really increased, I think 29% of our new hires in the past two years had a local connection to the city, whether they grew up in the city, whether they went to school here. Um, and that's a big, big increase over what we've seen in the past. Um, of course, you know, our best recruiters for the police department are members of the community. I think it's important that if people in the community want to see, um, their, their community represented in the police department, then they need to encourage individuals to apply to the police department. You know, oftentimes you hear about people wanting to change the police department. Well, the best way to change any organization is from the inside. And so we definitely encourage people to apply for the police department. Uh, we've always been hiring and uh, it's important for that to, to continue. Next slide, please. And here's where we talk about the grants. So um, if you look over the last, um, four or five years, so to speak, we've averaged a little over $2 million a year in grants. In 2020, 2021, we actually, from the police department, and I want to highlight that every grant that we've applied for from the police department was written by an employee of the police department. We did not hire anybody to go out there and write these grants. We did it ourselves. And I have never seen in my nearly 30 years here in the police department, a number like that we see that we've got in grants over $12 million in grants that we applied for. And you see to the right, the COPS grant was to hire additional officers. Um, you'll see a couple items on the agenda tonight. Uh, one of them is a tobacco grant, um, COVID-19, Office of Traffic Safety, the San Manuel, which is on the agenda tonight, UASI, which has to do more to do with terrorism, JAG grant, railroad safety grant, which we've never gotten before, and then a, a grant from the Alcohol Beverage Control. But over $12 million, and that's a lot of hard work going into those uh, grants, I think, as council members, um, we often hear um, a lot of talk about what are we doing to pursue grant opportunities? Well, here's a success story right here, $12 million last year. Uh, next slide, please. So there are some goals for the police department. Obviously, we always wanna to get to a fully staffed uh, police department for all of our approved positions. It's always a challenge because you do always have, uh, even if you get there for that slight moment, there's gonna be retirement or something happens and then you still have a position to fill. But we're working very hard to fill those positions and uh, we're being very successful at it. Uh, we wanna also in the future increase our non-sworn or professional staff positions. These all often supplement or augment our sworn positions. And one of them I wanna highlight is a criminal investigation officer. That's one of the jobs that we actually created in the last several years. Um, not too many agencies, none in the, re in the region have it, but they essentially function 
um, as a detective and realizing that they're not going to go in the field and make arrests and, and stuff like that. We don't pay them the same as we pay an officer who has to go out there and encounter that danger. They don't carry guns. They're civilian investigators. Um, and so it comes at a lower cost for us. So they get paid uh, less than what a police officer pays, but they do the job of the detective. Oftentimes, police officers, the pay they get sometimes is pretty decent, but it's not because um, they go and take reports. It's because they have to face danger. They have to wear a bulletproof vest, and there are you know, chances they could be injured on in the line of duty. Um, recognizing that the job is far less um, dangerous, um, that position gets paid less, but we can augment the police department with these positions, uh, return more sworn positions into the field, and at the end of the day, um, you can field three CIOs or criminal investigation officers for the cost of one detective. So it's a way to actually you know, become far more efficient as a police department at a lower cost, which I think everybody can appreciate in the city. We also wanna to continue to strengthen our community policing efforts. Uh, we're also continuing to invest in technology because we think it's very important to use data to drive our responses and, and, and programs and proactive responses. And so we're continuing to investigate, invest, invest in data or, or in, in uh, technology. And then uh, obviously continue to aggressively pursue funding to uh, further the department's mission and, and what the community wants. And so we'll continue. We look at every opportunity that for every grant that comes across that will this provide a benefit to us in the police department and in turn also provide a benefit to the community. And uh, we'll continue to be as aggressive in pursuing those grants as we have been in the past. And I think that's the end of the presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Chief, uh, this is an excellent report to the community. Um, and I wanna say thank you. Thank you to our San Bernardino Police Department, your leadership. And uh, there's um, what, what's amazing is the grants PowerPoint slide that we had there, nearly $12 million uh, this fiscal year in uh, the grants. and. We're doing some some excellent work. Um, so thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you to our patrolmen and the personnel that go along with that and support staff for uh, the operations there in our police department. Um, we are at 830 and we'll open it up for a few comments or reactions. Um, we're, we're, um, we're a little behind schedule, but nonetheless, um, we want to um, have our council members react. Councilmember Kelvin, please go ahead. Um, Chief McBride, I do want to congratulate you all on receiving $12 million in grants. That's a that's a hefty number. And so I do appreciate that. Um, I also wanted to just comment on the slide where you listed all the goals. And in our private discussions, we had also uh, mentioned hiring more African-American or African-American recruitment as being a goal as well for the department. And I didn't see that on your list. And I was just wondering why. I have to say that uh, we have far more goals than, than we have paper. Um, we do want to increase uh, representation of African-Americans in the police department. Uh, we have several right now that either in the academy or that are coming in as uh, laterals right now. And we are pursuing those opportunities and and I have to be honest that, uh, you know, we're doing everything we can. We're gonna see an increase in hopefully um, our budget for specifically for recruiting. And one of those uh, reasons for that is we wanna reach more communities out there, uh, target however, and we need suggestions on how to do that. I mean, if you have some ideas, we're abs absolutely open to, you know, open that up because it's a challenge for every police department. And if anybody's got what they think is a secret formula to, to, to solve that problem, we're open to it. So I ask, you know, when you have the opportunity or anybody else, um, let us know what you think might be a strategy that will work and we'll pursue it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, got to take it, got to take it. My apologies, council member, go ahead. Oh yeah, uh, thank you chief and thank you for all your department does. I have a few questions. Um, one, uh, when we did meet with you and the city manager, I know I brought up about a gun buyback program to be more proactive in getting guns off the street. And you stated that this would come up during this council meeting about a gun buyback program. And I'm looking for some response or something because 
that's what you stated to me and my fellow council members when we met with you about a gun buyback program. Thank you, council member. I don't believe that I stated it would be on this agenda. It is going to be next month. Um, as you see, we have a lot of items that were on the agenda um, this uh, council meeting. And we only have so many people and so many staff to write reports. Uh, that definitely is going to be on the council agenda for next month. And well, I appreciate if, if that. I could, I'm sorry, if I could clarify too, um, the, the, the process which the council's adopted for putting items on the agenda is it'd be presented as a at this meeting, for example, to be brought back as an actual staff report or a consent item at the next meeting. So it's on for tonight for approval to be to have the staff report prepared and brought back at the next meeting. So oh. it'll be the February 3rd agenda. So oh, tonight, you. tonight you request it and it comes back at the next meeting. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, about your 8,890 homeless outreaches. What, what, how, what are you, what exactly do you guys do when you make an outreach to 8,890 when we only have, according to the point in time count, 800 and more or less 64 people in our city that are homeless? What do you guys do? Yes, council member. So um, I know you haven't been present for any of our point in time counts or understand the, how the homeless population works, but there's been studies that suggest that it takes at least 50 individual contacts with a homeless individual to get them to change. So some of these are multiple contacts, obviously, with the same individual, um, but we have to go out there repeatedly to try to get these individuals into um, some to take to avail themselves of the resources. So um, those officers that are in the district resource are out there contacting those individuals on multiple occasions, because what our hope is to someday make them actually avail themselves of that services and get off the streets. So that requires multiple contacts, repeated contacts, again and again and again. Okay. And your grants, you're like, uh, that's a great number for grants, but what happens when the grant funding runs out for a particular grant? Who funds it then? It depends. The individual program, for example, the, uh, the one that you'll see on the agenda tonight is the tobacco grant. Um, that obviously is going to pay for, a, for three years for a police officer, a criminal investigation officer, and a community engagement officer. Um, that's a program that will run its course. Um, if it's not renewed, then through attrition, those positions will be uh, run off the books. So, for example, if a retirement occurs at the end, then that position won't be backfilled. So it, when it runs out, say like a COPS grant is for three years, when it runs out, then that position, those police officers that are working for the city will not be paid with a grant. It will be paid out of the general fund. That's if, the, the, if that's if the city council decides to retain those positions. Obviously the grant funded positions and if they fall off and the grant's not renewed and those are positions are no longer general fund uh, funded unless the council decides to do that. So that's a decision down the line that city council has to make whether they wanna retain those positions or eliminate them from the uh, staff. So uh, a quick question. When we book, we have we had uh, all those felony bookings, and I and I'm sorry, we had those three thousand two hundred forty five felony bookings. How when we when the, do you book them in West Valley? They can be booked at either West Valley or Central Detention Center. Depends on the individual circumstance of the person that's been arrested. Okay, great. How long does it take to book it? I know if I know West, I know Central is close, and I know West Valley is a is a little ways away. An officer books that individual, correct? Yes. Okay. Can our CIOs book that individual? Because how long does it take from arrest to booking for that officer to get back on the street? It depends on the staffing at the jail. Um, they can right. have one person booking individuals. That person might have to be interviewed by a nurse um, in, in detail. It also depends if they have any pre-existing medical issues. They might have to go to the hospital to get cleared for booking at the jail. So there's a lot of variables that come into place. If it's just someone who has no issues, um, there's only uh, nobody in the booking uh, area at, at Central Jail when they go there, you can relatively be out of there within probably 45 minutes or less. Okay. So I'm just trying to see how we can best use our CIOs, nest for investigation, or some other form of officer, a custody service officer maybe, to keep our officers on the street instead of you know, doing through in the booking process. Is that even a consideration or didn't we used to do that in uh, in our city a long time ago? We have. We uh, we were bringing a council item uh, to the council a little over a year ago regarding that. 
Um, there is a cost associated with that, obviously. And so that's something that with, if that's the direction from the city council and the city manager that we can definitely explore in the future, but it doesn't come at no cost. Right, right, great. Okay, okay. Uh, but one, I'm sorry, one last question. Have we reached out to our federal partners like my former agency or DEA to help with the narcotics uh, issue because I'm counting all the narcotics homicides and it's like 24 of them, according to your chart. Have we reached out them for their assistance? We do participate in several task forces. We, we partner with the FBI on some task forces and the ATF. Um, so we do have federal partners here in the city that are working with us. Thank okay, you. Okay, Council Member Ibarra, you had your hand up and then Council Member Reynoso. Council Member Ibarra. Thank you. Um, I'm going to echo what um, my colleagues are already saying. Thank you for um, the breakdown of all the grants that our police department is applying for. Um, Mr. City Manager, maybe this is something that we can um, start, I don't know, showing from every different um, department in our city to see what efforts they're all each doing and, you know, show our public, you know, how much of the general fund is being offset by additional granting um, that we're obtaining to help with the services that we provide to our constituents. So I, I commend that report. Thank you, um, Chief McBride. Um, and then, um, I mean, that, that was the main thing I was impressed with. Thank you so much, that report. Hey, uh, thank you, Council Member uh, Reynoso. Uh, Chief McBride, thank you for the presentation uh, and for all the work that you're doing on the streets. My question is very simple. Um, hopefully you can answer it as simply. When it comes to grant funding and you're supplementing the officers, so for example, you mentioned that you have 20 officers that are gonna be grant funded this year, potentially, um, after this meeting, potentially. Of what percentage, based on what you were answering to Councilman Alexander, of what percentage are you shifting those who are about to retire versus, like out of 20 positions, let's say San Manuel that's on there, for example, four proposed positions, how many of those officers are gonna be like young, and just getting into the department versus about to, like you said, um, be off the books, they're gonna retire. So those those grant funds don't fund existing officers on the department, they, they, they fund new hires. So okay. uh, that being said with the uh, pension reform, uh, obviously they, we're looking at holding on to those people for a long, long time, uh, unless Thank the you. funding goes away and we don't renew it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Thank you, council members. We, uh, final question, council member Rivara. Yes, um, Mr. City Manager or Chief uh, McBride, um, I had mentioned a couple meetings ago, a couple months ago, um, we are funding some community outreach um, recruiters for the homeless population right now with four different agencies, I believe. Uh, can, is there any way we can have them coordinate with the quality of life team so when they make those contacts at the homeless encampments that we're reporting, that they're the ones talking to the homeless population and help them seek the services they're obtaining or they need? Can we work on that? Yeah. The short answer is yes. Um, and in fact, we're looking, we're, we're embarking on some conversations with the county um, to sort of broaden and hopefully, you know, sort of rationalize and make more effective our overall homeless uh, uh, program. Um, so we will be integrating that uh, your request into that conversation with the county. We're hoping to strike, <clears throat> you know, arrange for some sort of a, an MOU or other agreement that will do a you know, better job of, of coordinating our efforts, um, defining roles, and, uh, and ultimately being more effective uh, in managing that issue. It's, it's one that, you know, has sort of defied a, a a uh, really effective response nationwide, um, but we are working on it constantly and it is a very high, it is absolutely a very high priority. So yes, thank, and thank you for your comment. Thank you, yeah, it, it would be a, a, a beautiful beginning if we start you know, bringing in the, the recruiters out there with our quality of life team. I know we were having a little concern with that, but as long as we each stay in our lane and do what we're supposed to, like our police officers do one, one area, public works does what they're supposed to and protect does their part. Uh, I think we can have pro probably even better outcomes. So just a suggestion. Thank you for that report again. Thank you very much, council member. All right, um, and chief, uh, great job. Thank you, keep up the great work and we do appreciate our police department. Let's move on to um, our public comments portion of tonight's uh, meeting. 
these are comments from the public and we'll turn it over to Miss City Clerk. We have 10 recorded comments for tonight's meeting. This is Crystal Whitmore with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I'd just like to take a minute once again to stop and focus on some of the good things that are happening in the city of San Bernardino. Um, over the holidays, there were so many people that were just out doing good deeds. It was amazing to watch. Um, one of the things that I thought was excellent this year was the interfaith Thanksgiving service. Um, for some reason, it just was so peaceful and supportive. And the other thing I noticed is it was extremely inclusive. There was just a lot of diversity and a lot of variety. Um, I was impressed that they had so much food that they donated to the Obershaw Bin at Cal State San Bernardino and also the monetary donations that went to Catholic Charities. Um, and once again, providing food for the people that really need it seemed to be in abundance the last couple of months. Um, I also witnessed a small mountain of new toys that were in the San Bernardino area. So that was great to watch. Anyway, um, the, I was thinking about the community parades, and I had mixed feelings about that during a pandemic. But as I witnessed a couple of those, I thought, you know, I actually think that they were handled very well in the middle of a pandemic and that they brought a lot of joy and a lot of good out in our communities. It was nice to see the communities coming together. Anyway, thanks for letting me take a couple of minutes and thank you for all the good you do for the city of San Bernardino. Hi, my name is Jesse Capps and I'm making a general public comment. I'd like to congratulate Robert Porter who's being appointed to a committee tonight. Um, I know that he'll do a really good job. I'd also like to um, thank my new council person, um, Ben. Uh, I was able, I'm able to text with him and his name's Ben Reynoso, so I want to welcome him to the council and um, hoping that we can resolve an issue that I'm uh, currently working on with the city. I'm a homeowner in the Autumn Villas of San Bernardino and our infrastructure has not been completed. Uh, we have 12 lights and paving inside this development. Uh, the builder is GFR Homes, and I've sent emails and I'm dealing with Michael Huntley and Ben Reynoso and several people on this issue. So I certainly hope that we can get this resolved before GFR Homes is allowed to develop any more properties um, in the city. GFR is a very good builder, but um, I've lived here long enough, and these homes should have been completed by now. We, we have no lights in the back, and it's, um, it's just pitch black back there at night. And uh, we just need the development to be finished. So whatever uh, can be done to facilitate that, I'd really appreciate it. And also with these power, PSPS, these power safety uh, public shutoffs that the Southern California Edison is doing, it's very disruptive to our lifestyle here in the North End, particularly with people uh, you know, working from home. So hopefully something can be done about that because um, it's a very um, unpleasant situation. So anyways, um, have a good meeting and thank you for listening. Hi, yes, my name is Mary Hernandez and this is uh, regarding the closed session. Um, I'm, I have a complaint about my neighborhood. I live on the corner of 27th and Ladera and there's always a lot of uh, cars going really fast on 27th. I was hoping they could put some kind of uh, speed bumps or something there between uh, J Street and Muscovy Abbey. They drive really fast through there, so I wish there was something they can do about this. My phone number is 909-882-2563 in case you have any questions. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sierra, and this is for open session in regards to homelessness and street cleaning. So homelessness is one of the biggest issues in our city. What is the mayor of Valdivia doing to combat this short term, and what are the plans long term? Also, 
Although is it, although it is greatly appreciated, why do we keep using our police force to clean up our streets instead of having a dedicated department within the city? We cannot continue to pull our police officers away from keeping our streets safe for this. Debris dumped on our streets in the city is an ever-growing problem that needs to be addressed for the long term. Are there any alternative solutions in place for this issue? Thank you. Yes, this is Harry Hatch, resident Ward 7. Good evening, Council and Mayor. Uh, first off, I have a question. Uh, I was under the impression that we were going to get an update or something as to when the workshop would be on the Central City Mall project with the two people or groups coming in to tell us what they, their plans are. Uh, I was under the impression I was going to be done sometime today, but I don't see it on calendar. Uh, if I could get that question answered, I'd appreciate it. Going on, fireworks. I have still been working on the fireworks ordinance. Uh, you have the latest drafts in your possession on how you can change the fireworks ordinance to give it a little teeth so the police department has at least a chance to enforce the fireworks ordinance in the city of San Bernardino. Off-road vehicles in the north end. We have had a, pardon the expression, herd of off-road vehicles driving around up here. Based on the information I have been receiving, there are several groups in the north end area that have what they call rideouts. In fact, there is another rideout scheduled for the 24th, this Sunday, at noon, at which they're expecting, based on my information, somewhere between 100 to 150 bikes, all going up and down streets in the city of San Bernardino on a takeover. This information has been passed on to the police department. But just for the council's edification, that's what's happening in your city. Speaking of the police department, uh, I understand that we were going to have a presentation by Chief McBride tonight. I looked for the documentation to see what he was going to be discussing. If it is the stats, uh, then I will shut up. If it isn't the stats, I would definitely like to know how many homicides we have had last year, uh, what the status is, and the status on several other issues such as fireworks and vehicle traffic. Thank you for your time. Harry Hatch, Ward 7. Hello, this is Robert Porter, fourth generation living in San Bernardino. This is for items uh, in the open meeting and items not on the agenda. I'd like to thank everybody um, up there for the opportunity to be the Arts and Historical Preservation Commission Commissioner for the Seventh Ward. I'd like to thank Damon Alexander for believing in me, and you can definitely say that I believe in him. Um, I'd also like to mention that if we are going to develop the Carousel Mall area, would it be possible to uh, make it in a facade that's similar to like old Hispanic or old time history um, look? You know, kind of like the Mission Inn. So the Mission Inn isn't a real mission, but it was built to look like a mission. And now they have those huge festivals around it with all the lights and stuff at Christmas. Maybe we could do something like that in San Bernardino um, once we're done with this, if it looked old time, if it was set up for the arts, if it was set up for history. Instead of just trying to do everything modern, let's set it up after our own great history right here in San Bernardino. So that's my suggestion for the Carousel Mall. I know we can do it. I want to thank everybody for uh, letting me try this commissionership stuff. I'm really into it, and I'm, uh, I'll work hard for the city. I love San Bernardino. Thank you very much. Robert Porter, fourth generation living in San Bernardino. Hello. My name is Cheryl Brown, and this message is for Hardy Brown. Um, Hardy says, I hope all of you had a happy holiday that was filled with all of your prayers and that your wishes were met. My congratulations to this new leadership sitting on the council to address the people's needs. I might add 
that is also a new day in Washington with President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. Having said that, we still have some unfinished business that you need to address. You still have an executive police staff that's comprised of five males who do not reflect the demographics of the city. I noticed on the police department webpage that it lists McBride as chief and Green as assistant chief, but it did not say when that happened. I did seek clarification from the city manager, and he said that they are still interim in those positions. I am suggesting you evaluate reforming public sa the Public Safety Commission and give it more responsibility and authority. I'm also suggesting that you review the police department in these areas, diversity of staff, staffing patterns in the community, police pay as related to other Inland Empire police departments, comparison of crime rates as it relates to the salaries that we pay them. I read in an article that our city has the highest crime rate in California. To me, that says there's something wrong, and you, the council, need to fix it. In my opinion, we cannot have good economic development until we correct this negative image with high crime, employee lawsuits against one another, and no employment for blacks, and a promotional system that's not inclusive of blacks. Add to that a pay-to-play system for political candidates. We have a new city manager and a new council and a new year we saw how abuse of power and corruption in the Republican Party led to an attempted overthrow of our government. There is still hope for us. If you as policymakers and management staff decide to be inclusive and just in your decision making with the employment and granting of contracts to all citizens. Thank you. That's Hardy Brown uh, on the west side of San Bernardino. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Kathy Kimball, a resident of San Bernardino. I have been for 74 years. Uh, my number is, uh, oh, I guess you don't need that. I'm calling about these fireworks, the fact that they're still totally being ignored. I had an incident last um, Monday uh, where I called the police department at 8.40 at night. It sounded like 10 bombs went off in my front yard, and I figured part of my house had been blown up. I am a person who has not left my house in eight months because I have lung disease, and I didn't know what was happening. Uh, I was still inside when I called the police. When I got to the um, front door, they answered. I had dialed 911 because it scared me so bad I didn't know what it was. Uh, and it, the blasts were still going off. And uh, uh, when I got the death person, she put me through to um, a, an officer. At least she said she was putting me through to an officer, so I assume that's what she did. Uh, when I explained to him what was happening and that I was now at my front door looking out, uh, about the only thing that happened was I got my... Uh, behind chewed for calling 911, which I did apologize for, but as I said at the time, I had no idea what was happening. I thought something had blown off the front of the house. Um, it is an issue that needs to be addressed. It was not regular fireworks because there was nothing in the sky. I couldn't go out to see because I couldn't leave my house, but my neighbors were all out in front and said they thought it was guns or whatever. We need to do something more. I don't care what, but we need to do something. Thank you. My name is Jessica Ortiz. I'm a current resident of San Bernardino. I've been here for 25 years, and major concerns about the city that I've been seeing getting worse and worse. Number one, I think, is homeless. Um, we need to come up with uh, a solution to get these people home, especially with all these empty buildings. Um, number two would be prostitution. I think it's getting worse as well. Um, number three would be dumping. Um, I remember not so long ago, our streets were a little bit more clean. Um, and number four would be potholes. So in that order, um, potholes, it is a major issue. I've had to um, fix my wheels twice. I'd like to see some changes in that. Um, 
If you need to reach out to me, my phone number is 909-965-2561. Hopefully soon we can find a solution to all these problems. Thank you. This is a public comment for Treasurer Ortiz for open session. Council, good evening. I have a few questions. I'm wondering why there is no backup material for agenda item number six on a public safety presentation. It seems like every time the chief of, acting chief of police is going to, to prepare some type of presentation, we don't get the material. We don't get to see the numbers beforehand. We don't get to analyze or review any information like we do with other agenda items. And it's utterly ridiculous, especially in a time when public safety has failed. We've had 70 murders in the last year, up from 42 the previous year. And we're, instead of doing something to help the residents and change things, the acting chief of police was out running for office in Big Bear. It's utterly unacceptable, and I ask, and I know Sandra has asked repeatedly, that these types of presentations be delivered to the public in the regular agenda like every other item. I also want to know why we continue to annex properties into the city when we can't even provide basic services to residents who are already here. We are a strained system, and as much as these ridiculous numbers showing us in the black are being tossed around in conversation, I have yet to see any budget showing that San Bernardino is on a rebound. After closing a deficit in our last budget fiscal year, how is it now that we have this abundance of cash just to bring everybody into our system? We can't get the police officers to our homes. We don't have code enforcement. We can't keep the libraries open with adequate hours, but all of a sudden we can annex these other properties. These things have to change. I ask you guys to please bring forward something, a real plan, a plan that will sustain the city. We were supposed to have a presentation in the downtown development by one of the developer groups. We heard that there was a big ruckus and the mayor, of course, threw a fit because he already has a developer chosen for the downtown, which is part of the Chinese delegation that paid for him to go to China. This is the type of corruption we deal with in our city. Residents don't get fed the correct information to provide for transparent understanding and choices. We have hidden agendas by political officials, the lack of caring by public administrators. This is wrong. Nobody should be able to cross the street out of San Bernardino and be in an entirely different world of government, of prosperity, and development. We need this stuff here at home. Thank you. And that concludes public comment. Okay, thank you very much. Let's move on to item number seven. This is the Encanto Community Center Improvement Project in Ward 6. The recommendations there before you. Mr. City Manager, if you provide the update for us, please. Yes, with pleasure. Thank you. Um, the uh, the project in front of you today is uh, is a proposal to remodel um, what was once the Boys and Girls Club uh, facility on 9th Street. Uh, we have secured funding and developed a plan um, at, that will be put in place by a combination of the Parks Department and the Public Works Department. I believe that Chris Jensen is going has a PowerPoint is going to lead us on a discussion, uh, uh, kind of walk us through what it is that uh, is proposed to happen there. So, Chris, please. Sure. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. Good evening, Mayor and members of Council. Um, Mitch, do we have our PowerPoint? Great. So, yes, item number seven tonight um, for your consideration is a project to construct um, needed improvements at the in Canto Community Center um, in hopes of being able to restore community services um, at this facility. Just a quick background, the Community Center, Center sorry, is located on West 9th Street between L and North Mount Vernon. It was built in 1968. In 1970, the Boys and Girls Club entered into a 50-year lease with the city and the club provided operation and programming um, of that facility for the community for that 50 years. Um, their lease ended in early 2020, January of 2020. Um, during their time, they had subleased a portion of the building to the county for the um, preschool Head Start program. 
Um, the county is still in that small portion today. Um, the building itself is about a 24,000 square foot building. And um, if we go to the next slide, the facility has um, a number of amenities that um, really give anybody who is programming this facility the ability to provide a wide range of activities to the community. As you can see, um, and you're probably aware that we've got a pool, a gym, there's also office spaces, um, community rooms that are rented, um, and music and dance rooms there as well. So right now, unfortunately, because of COVID, um, you know, a lot of our community centers aren't being used. So we're really um, kind of taking a look um, at what we can do to improve them. So next slide. So when the Boys and Girls Club left, um, staff went and was able to do some investigating of the condition of the building. And what we found was that after 50 years of use, um, as you can imagine, there was quite a bit of work that needed to be done. Um, specifically and most critically, the roof was very deteriorated. Um, at the time in early 2020, the HVAC units um, were also in very poor shape. Unfortunately, since then, they have been completely vandalized. Um, so we have full replacements on the HVACs that need to occur. And in addition to that, we also, we found that there were some cosmetic deficiencies. Obviously, paint and flooring needed help. Um, there were ADA um, standards that um, were out of date because of the age of the building. And so as we looked and talked through this with council, we identified the roof as well as the HVAC system as being the most critical to really preserve the building and everything that was underneath it. And in fiscal year 2021, the mayor and city council um, did approve for $665,000 in CDBG funding for the roof replacement, and then also an additional $250,000 through cultural development funds to address the HVAC. Next slide, Mitch. So as we were preparing to do the two large critical projects that were funded, we kind of went and took another look um, because Encanto is um, in such a, an area that services kind of such a, a wide range of our community. Um, the, the location of the, the building itself, it's physically located obviously in the sixth ward. Directly across the street though, you have the first ward. And when we took a look at a mile radius around this facility, um, we really end up physically kind of touching four wards. We, we wrap in walkable, um, walkable areas from not only the the sixth and the first ward, but also the second and the third ward. And as we, again, kind of looked at this to try to figure out ways that we could um, reestablish this facility, um, we really started to talk about, too, the fact that all of the amenities that are in this facility really promote and draw in and reach out people from um, to people from a more regional um, level too and kind of out beyond the boundaries of, of just what we're looking at here and what we would think about in terms of the type community that that serves. Next slide. So improvements at the facility beyond the HVAC unit and the roof um, include a number of things. Um, like I said, that we would be looking at ADA, we'd have to change flooring. We would also now with COVID um, have to look at spacing um, guidelines that we would need to meet for CDC and try to be prepared for any changes in the pandemic or any future challenges um, related to um, pandemics that we would have to, to deal with. But in, in addition to those things, Constructing improvements at this facility really helps us to address a number of deferred maintenance items that are going to preserve the facility for use for a very long time by the city. And taking this holistic approach, I think, um, was something that we felt was important in order 
to make sure that we could restore services that had been in this area for almost 50 years through the Boys and Girls Club. We also all know that the having activity at a facility or at a park also helps to deter any of the vandalism or the negative activities that can tend to kind of tuck into the corners when you have vacant buildings. Um, and while we were kind of looking at, okay, what would that, what would that mean and maybe look like to occupy that building? We started talking about the fact that the building itself has the ability to support and house the Parks and Recreations Department ad administration. And that kind of one thing kind of led to another. The Parks and Administration staff now, as you all know, are housed here in the 201 building on the, on the first floor. They're down there with the city clerk's office, I think, and with a business license as well. Being able, sorry, I got to grab a drink. Being able to potentially relocate our parks and rec staff into the Encanto Center would give us the, the ability to program um, you get our programs going again with with our existing staff. It could be supported with uh, Mr. Tickmeyer's staff. Um, and then also would free up some space too kind of meeting double duty here because we have been talking for a while about trying to establish a one-stop shop in the facilities that we have now to bring some convenience to, to our public, our developers, our customers. So we, as we kind of wrapped all of this together in this project, um, we then obviously had to take a look at maybe what our, our funding source would be. So um, next slide. Mitch, thanks. Sorry, got ahead of myself. We actually went out to find out what we thought it might cost. And um, to do that, we needed to get information on design services for the inside of the building in terms of what, what we would be looking at to have the project designed. And so Alex Kishta, our city engineer and his staff went out in October. Um, we propo got proposals from some of our on-call engineers that we've got, and we evaluated those proposals. There were three that we received and found that Miller Architectural Corporation um, rated the highest through that process. And the design services that we requested for this, obviously we're looking at office space redesign. Like I said, anything that's gonna address our ADA and bring it up to standard. There's a lot of mechanical designing that has to go on. And then um, we also looked at having them design some outside landscape and um, parking lot improvements. Next slide, Mitch. So the funding support for the project. So the city had received um, a donation, the Parks Department had received a donation that um, we are recommending be set aside for this project. The donor has indicated that the donation was to be used to support the Parks and Recreation Department. And we think that by being able to take the funding we've already established through CDBG for our roof, and our HVAC, and then use these donation funds towards the design and then ultimately constructing the improvements will, again, the, the benefits it'll bring will be preserving the facility that we have now so that we have it for another 50 years of use. Um, having that facility able to be occupied and inviting to the community will really help us to bolster the restoration of the programming and get the facility used as it was intended once again. And then also create that potential relocation opportunity that then opens up another opportunity here on the City Hall campus side of things, if you would. Next slide, Mitch. So this slide, 
basically summarizes what we are looking at in terms of the project funding that we've identified for Encanto. Um, again, our CDBG funding in the amount of 665,000, cultural development for 250,000, and then the donation fund of about 2.2 million. The, um, the budgets for the roof and the HVC, again, have already been approved. So really tonight, what we are looking for from council um, is a couple of things. The next slide, please, Mitch. We're looking for you to approve the use of the donated funds to support this project. Um, we're asking also that you, um, that you award a professional services agreement with Miller Architectural so that we can move forward in getting the design done um, for the build. The amount of that contract is $178,000 and that would be coming out of those donation funds as the other funds are already um, established for the other pieces of the project. So a little rushed, I'm sorry, there you go. Excellent presentation, uh, this is awesome. Uh, I wanna commend the staff, a um, couple observations. Uh, first and foremost, I think this is a brilliant and creative use of um, monies, and uh, I want to compliment the staff for this. Chris, Jim, Alex, great work. Uh, out of the box thinking, uh, repurposing an old facility, modernizing it, improving it. Um, I say let's let's commit. You know, this is awesome. We, we need to probably pave the street from L to Mount Vernon um, <laughs> on, on the on the end of this whole project. But this is good. Uh, I move is, uh, items one, two, three uh, staff recommendation. This is a great opportunity for our community. My other observation is this, that this now allows for uh, staff to actually be back in the community. I like that move. This allows our public, um, our, I'm sorry, our parks and rec department to go back into the community service uh, uh, mode. And I, I think this is a great win for our community. There is a motion by Councilman and uh, is there a second? Yes, yeah, second. By Councilman Charette, sir. Um, do you have a comment or Council Member Barra? Yes, uh, I'm just curious, Ms. Jensen, um, the third item, um, we're awarding Miller Architect. What were the other quotes that uh, we had received? So I, we, we've got three on-call um, design engineers that were, that, were, that were established actually by the, the city council through an RFP. So we requested from those. Um, Alex, do you have the information on the other quotes that were received? Uh, good evening, Mayor. And Just like an amount. Uh, yeah. yeah, I will search through my record and see what I can get. Uh, the three, um, the three uh, consult, uh, the three architectural consultant that we have on call is Miller's architect, infrastructure engineers, and BOA, and they both uh, did give us proposal. And the evaluation proposal was Miller was the best that understood the project aspects. But I believe that is BO, BO, BOA have about 220,000 proposal. And then infrastructure was at a low of about 55,000. But evaluating the proposal, they did not address all the issue that we discussed in our meeting when we met with them at the facility and told them what needed to be done. So we excluded them from there and that we concluded that Miller's is the best that can you know um awesome address that address that there's a project thank you i'm i'm used to seeing all their quotes in other reports and i didn't see that, it here so i would be more than happy to <laughs> uh, to provide um the 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 uh, quotes and you know uh, and the proposals if if that is if city manager chris you know it's okay with it i'll be more than happy to do it no problem thank you alex thank you uh, council member alexander sir go ahead Thank you, uh, Director Jensen. Outstanding report. I love it. Very well done. I just have a, a question um, about the the vendor, the professional service contract. Did we uh, do San Bernardino first? Was there any 
uh, organizations in San Bernardino that we w reached out to first before we went outside the city? So the vendors that we used, Council Member Alexander, thank you, um, were, at, were actually established through an RFP process um, with the city and approved by the city council previously. Right. Um, so the, I think Alex can can chime in and tell you about any of the other vendors out of San Bernardino. But we we actually pro requested these proposals from architectural firms that we had already qualified um, mm -hmm. to provide these type of services for the engineering department. Okay. Uh, well, I'm. I'm. I was going to pull every item and ask the same question. Do we do we reach out to San Bernardino firms first, or give them deference or preference because they're in the city? Uh, we, and when we do our when we do our bids, we obviously post everything on our website. We have. Um, we also go through um, our our plan. Can't remember the, um, the name yeah, of them, yeah. Alex. Thank you. Yeah, what we do <laughs> for the RFP uh, for the request for proposals process that we do uh, for consultant, we send an RFP out address. You know, um, talking about the services needed. We in this particular one, we received about eight proposals for the architectural services. Uh, staff have evaluated, or none of the proposals were in San Bernardino. We always give five percent extra for San Bernardino firms uh, when they submit their uh, RFPs. But, you know, from these eight proposals, the evaluation with the staff give the high, the, the BOA, infrastructure engineers, and Miller's architect the highest grade. So they are on call. And the reason why we use them and we did not use an RFP process, which is will attract a bigger group of people, is because of the timing. The timing is for, for the essence. And there is CDBG funds that is tied to the project that we need. You know, we need to we need I, to address and we need to spend. I I, I hear you and I understand. Um, <laughs> yes. I, and I understand. I'm just trying to get subcontractors something where we can redirect funds to our own city first. That's that's all I'm saying, um, Madam uh, City Attorney. Do we have any policy on minority vendors or and or small business vendors for the city? Do we have any policy on that? Or do we have to legislate that as a as a as a council? Um, you would need to adopt a local ordinance, which we could definitely um, look into because you are a charter city. Um, I am aware that some federal grants and state grants may have such requirements, so we may want to ask staff if they have um, implemented regulations in accordance with those state and federal requirements. One of the other opportunities is uh, the procurement and purchasing department. Council Member Alexander, we, we'd be happy through the city manager's office, acquaint you and familiarize you with that process. Um, a lot of that uh, is in the consideration built in. So, we'd be happy so we have, so Mr. Mayor, so we have a minority policy about minority uh, vendors. Well, what I'm saying is many of the, the, the positions that or questions that you're having uh -huh. are valid and okay. um, they can be addressed um, either through the LRC committee, through conversations with staff, or really the city manager, uh, but they're very valid points. The other, the other opportunity is on the, um, as I mentioned, procurement and purchasing. Um, the local uh, preference credit is listed usually on, within their um, uh, worksheet, and so um, we we do do that. It's sometimes a little hard for local. Uh, vendors to either do, they don't respond or we don't hear from them from the local business community. Okay, so um, Mr. City Manager, can we talk about minority vendors, uh, professional service agreements, and a small business policy for our, our city? Is that is that possible? Absolutely, it is. Um, and I think it's um, you and I were talking the other day about the policy manual. Actually, I think there are so many complexities when it comes to purchasing, uh, the rules around purchasing different types of commodities, public works, for example, um, in most instances, when you're hiring contractors, you are obligated to follow the public works part portion of the state contract code. And there are some areas where you can establish local preferences in some areas, most areas where you cannot. 
Um, but in terms of purchasing goods and services, other types of services, you can establish local preferences. Um, it, it all will go, that really runs through the, the purchasing department, the purchasing and is established by the purchasing manual. So this ultimately is going to be essentially, you know, we, we are in the process of taking a look at all of those policies uh, to the extent that they exist here. Um, and we'll be establishing some new ones as well. And then we have to, it's, then it's an education process for ourselves, uh, for, for the staff, uh, for the council and for the public in, in, uh, in general. Um, certainly where we can, I, per, you know, local preference is a huge deal. Um, as, as the mayor noted, I think there are a lot of uh, times when the funding source will dictate what types of programs um, you have to adopt and utilize. For example, there are a lot of federal funding programs that require minority business enterprise, veteran business enterprise, women-owned business enterprise, um, the, you know, disabled veteran business, are, I, there are all kinds of different categories that can be applied, applied, but it is an extraordinarily complex set of issues. And there are a lot of laws and regulations that govern it. So uh, what I think we should do is work with the city so attorney's office uh, and public works and bring back um, the first one explanation um, and also some policy recommendations for the council to chew on and you know, sort of provide us with, uh, with guidance on this um, because it is, it's very topical. Um, it is a big issue. It'll become an even bigger issue if the Biden administration, for example, does bring forth things like a, an infrastructure bill. Um, the federal requirements tend to ha uh, have more robust sets of, of uh, uh, you know, certain measures that are required to be adopted and included in a project. So um, it's a long way of getting around to, uh, we have some stuff now, we have a lot more to develop and uh, we will do that, uh, as I said, in concert with the city attorney's office. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate that answer. I appreciate it. Appreciate you, uh, Director Jensen, and what your staff is doing. Can I, it, uh, Mayor, can I make one more note? Sure, yeah. I think it's, it's one of the things that's kind of rewarding about this. Not only are we getting Parks and Rec um, out back out into the field, but I think this is the first time, at least that I can, that I can find that, that a, uh, a city department is going to be headquartered uh, on the west side. Um, so I think it's important to note that too. It's, it's one of those things that's gonna, it, it, it provides a lot of benefits. And as you noted, it gets, as Chris noted, uh, it brings us the ability to establish a one-stop permitting center. And one of the things we need to do is a, is a better job of providing services to businesses and residents of the city um, so that they have a single point of contact when they come in. You know, if you wanna do, you wanna build a, an auxiliary unit at your house or do make other improvements, you know, let's, let's make it as easy as we can be more, more user friendly, business friendly here if we can. So this gives us that opportunity too. Okay, um, wonderful. Let's uh, let's call for the question here, uh, Miss City Clerk. We have a motion in a second, and if you would please call the roll. Councilmember Sanchez. Yes. Councilmember Ibarra. Yes. Councilmember Figueroa. Yes. Councilmember Charette. Yes. Councilmember Reynoso? Yes. Councilmember Calvin? You're muted, but I'm, you're saying yes, correct? Of course, of course, yes. Thank you. Councilmember Alexander? Aye. His motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Council. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Council, for your support on that. All right, moving into our consent calendar for tonight, items eight through 27, we'll pull council members. Uh, let's start it off with Councilman Alexander and we'll work down. Councilman uh, Alexander, any polls tonight? No, sir. Uh, council member Kelvin. You're muted. Yes, I'd like to pull 11, 17, 24 and 26. Okay, council member uh, Reynoso. All right, Joe. <laughs> 15, 16, 19, 21 through 24, 26 and 27. I'm sorry? 15, 16. No, I got that, the last part. 21 through 24, 26 and 27. I was hoping to go last so that I would have like less to say, but. Council member Charette, go ahead, sir. Haven't they all been pulled? <laughs> I have none. Council member Figueroa. None. All right, council member Ibarra. 
None, but I do have a quick uh, question on number nine. And also if mayor and city clerk, if you can address me as mayor pro temp, that'd be great. You appreciate it. Thank you. Go ahead on your item number nine, your question. Yes, for item number nine, when are the meet, the meeting minutes going to be posted on our city website? Um, as of today, I checked and we don't have them from April 2020 through November 2020. Those minutes have not been posted on our website for the city council meetings. All right. Thank you, council member. Um, council Mayor member Protem. Sanchez. Mayor Pro Tem, please, Mayor. No, no items to pull. I'd like to move the balance if there is. Thank there you, is a balance. Noted with the second by. <laughs> second. Second by Councilman Figueroa. And uh, if the city clerk would please uh, call the roll. Yeah, uh, yes. You're, you're Sorry, muted. I'm muted. Uh, Council Member Sanchez. Mayor Pro Tem Ibarra. Yes. Council Member Figueroa. Yes. Council Member Shura. Yes. Council Member Reynoso. What exactly are we voting on right now? The balance. The items. One more time. One. Oh, on the consent items. Yes. Council Member Kelvin. Yes. And Council Member Alexander. Aye. Okay. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Council Member uh, <laughs> Kelvin, item number 11. Yes, yeah, so I just had um, a couple of questions. I really wanted to get a clear understanding. Um, there were three of um, three addresses in the sixth ward, and I wanted to know just how do we decide, or how are these um, areas brought to our attention? Do we already have an abatement program? Strongly. Yep. So yes, the city currently has. Um, an abatement program. It's actually listed within our uh, municipal code. Um, and these are, so just kind of a broader perspective for the council. Um, these are from active code enforcement cases. So the properties, uh, Councilman Calvin, that you're bringing up were identified as outstanding code enforcement cases. Those went through a process. The city had to spend time with abating whatever nuisance occurred on the property. And really what this is, is this is the city's way to recoup the cost necessary to abate whatever issue occurred on those properties. So this is fairly standard for us. Are they vacant? No, um, some of them might be vacant. Some of them might be existing buildings where we had to abate certain conditions on the property. Some of them could be um, one, for instance, on here too, dealt with a fire damage building where the city had to spend money to tear down a hazardous um, structure. So what we typically do is for those properties where the individual did not pay the um, abatement fee, what the city does is the city liens the property, um, the ba the balance of what was being charged so the city in the future can recover those costs. And so how long did that process take? Because I'm, I'm really trying to figure out what's the difference then between them and the Langendorf Bakery. Well, so every case, so first and foremost, you have to understand that, you know, we have a lot of cases in the city and we have six code enforcement officers, right? So with that said, uh, as we go through the pro, or I shouldn't say products, but as we go through these properties, whether the city is um, abating them, each one might be a little bit different depending on what the circumstances are, right? If there's a fire damage structure, the city had to tear it down. Uh, the tear down may be a lot quicker due to hazardous conditions. There may be other cases where there's outstanding code and for code violations on the property. We have to follow a certain process in um, abating it. At some point, if you'd like to, we could sit down and I could walk through that with you so you have a better idea in regards to what the city's process is. But that process is identified in the uh, municipal code for how we abate nuisances within the city. One more question. And on uh -huh. the list that we were given of all the addresses, were the majority of those uh, single family homes? Um, and my reason for asking that question is because with the, with the amount of abandoned buildings that were once businesses that are on our thoroughfares, I was just wondering why aren't we, uh, are we spending as much time addressing those um, uh, facilities or businesses or old buildings that need to be abated as well? Seems like these were in neighborhoods and I'm trying to figure out 
Are we not handling what's on our main thoroughfares as well? Because we have a lot of abandoned buildings, a lot of buildings that need to be abated on Highland, Mount Vernon, you know, Medical Center, other streets, main thoroughfares in our city. So what's the procedure as far as that's concerned? So let me um, address first what's on the agenda tonight. And that's actually, these are actually active code enforcement cases and what, or were active code enforcement cases. And a lot of these are responses to complaints from the community, right? So this, you know, these are active complaints. The city goes out, we respond to them and we abate whatever the issues are. When it deals with, you know, some of the abandoned or vacant buildings in the city, like indicated, I mean, kind of dealt a certain, you know, a, a, a deck or a um, woman dealt a hand where we currently only have six code enforcement officers for a very large city. I don't disagree with you that, you know, we should be being more proactive. Um, unfortunately, we're just dealing with those complaints that come in from the public right now, unfortunately so. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there a motion for approval? Who to approve? I'll Somebody second. 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 There we go. Second. That's how we operate, folks. Let's call for the question. Is there any objections? All right, seeing none, um, Ms. City Clerk, if you could uh, record unanimous. Um, item number seven, I'm sorry, item number 15, uh, Council Member Reynoso. Yeah, I'll be brief on most of these. Um, basically, my understanding of these proposed community facilities districts, um, they're going to be bonded, and that looks like basically annexing areas that a developer is essentially developing on the outside of. And so I kind of wanted someone whoever's best finance director, maybe it's city manager, to kind of explain to the public what the repayment plan is and uh, what the taxpayer's role is in biting that bullet. Is there a financial cost for the people living in the proximity, in the city, et cetera? Well, I, this will be a constant theme. Okay, um, so I, mostly I'm gonna turn this over to Sam Singery for, for the answer, although I can tell you, I mean, these are property tax based uh, assessments. So the, the, the property owners are the ones who uh, repay these through their property tax assessments. But Sam, why don't you go through the, give them some details. Those in the annexed area, correct? Within the, within the community facilities district. So any parcel within the CFD, yep. um, right. they are all assessed. So Sam or Alex, I think Alex popped back on too. So if you guys could uh, give a more detail. To that. Hi, good evening, um, Council and Mayor. Um, yeah, not really a lot to add from what the uh, city manager stated, but yeah, it's only the um, residents within that, the boundaries of the CFD that are formed um, that are going to be paying the additional assessments through their property taxes to fund those services and the, the debt service on those bonds. And that's going... That's coming back to us, or is that in negotiation, or is that still contingent on the negotiation that we had with County Fire? Are they going to be receiving that money? No, this is, I guess, an additional assessment on top of the normal assessed property taxes. That is what goes to fund the the services um, within that CFD. I don't know, Shane or Alex, if you have anything to clarify. Uh, that. Yes. Uh, good evening, Council Member. Usually these um, CFDs is to finance a particular thing that is we have within the boundary of the track itself. I believe that is a 2021-1 is for the community facilities that is deal with infrastructure that isn't within the community. And that is assessed, goes to the, um, to the, to the developer to install all the infrastructures. I'm talking about maybe water lines, sewer lines, streets, and then it passes to the property owner to pay back for the bonds. For example, the next one is the 2018-1, which is item number 16. That is only particular for uh, for fire, for sorry, for police services. That is this community is paying the city for the police services to, you know, for, for, for them because adding that to the city. So that is also passed to the um, homeowners that purchasing uh, these homes within the track. And that is also goes to the other two that we have, which is the maintenance, um, maintenance CFD, which is basically addresses the streets, the all the concrete sidewalk, curb gutter, street lights, any landscaping within a public right of way. Also the homeowners are paying 
the fees for the city to maintain that for them within the facility. So all of this has to be equal no more than 2% of the total value of the project. So there is a big financing that goes through it just to make sure that is, um, you know, that is done right. And our consultant that is do that for us, you know, keep a track of these and make sure that is the numbers is jive. Okay, with that in mind, I, let's bundle items uh, with your consent and pleasure, uh, Mr. Reynoso, this items 15 and 16. Uh, let's bundle it if that's okay, because that serves as a response to 16. Are you okay with that? Sure. So if there's a motion for approval to combine, let's uh, vote on 15 and 16. Is there a motion? I move. Second. Second by Councilman I would ask, I, I would ask at a, if I could have put it. I would ask as a courtesy if, uh, if the director, Chris Jensen, could possibly send out um, that same uh, consultant's report on what a CFD is. I, it was very helpful to me because two years ago, I didn't know what it was. Um, we have consultants that we pay good money to who produced a report on what a CFD is and how, how really that is the way of the future to finance a lot of these uh, burdened projects. So what this does is really in essence, it gives the city free money to maintain these new developments. And it's nothing more than that. It's a really good thing. We we approve them almost every other council meeting. We have had a lot of development in the city. So if if the director would do us the favor of sending out that um, that consultant's uh, summary of what a CFD is, I think that would help not just the council members but but the public in general. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. That's what I. Council that's my concern. members, let's go ahead and uh, if there's no objections on items 15 and 16, we have a motion and a second. Uh, I see none. So, clerk, if you take uh, that um, as our recorded um, response. Moving on to item number 17, Council Member Calvin. Item number 17. Yes. Yeah, so, I would just also, again, like some clarification on this. Uh, my understanding is that these are funds, uh, these are dollars that are gone um, unaccounted for. And as a city, we then go in to see which one of our city members um, have. Uh, funds in their name, and then we try to recoup them. Is that am I correct? Understanding that? Yes, uh, council members. Thank you for your question. Um, yeah, that's that's <laughs> um, you know outstanding checks on the city side that essentially has gone unclaimed or uncashed, and so it's to try to contact the P pays of those amounts um, to help them recover their funds. So it's just. Um, it's just um, funds that the city has issued uh, a constituent. Okay, thank you very much. Is that a motion to approve? Yes. Second. Any objections? Okay, none, I hear none. So let's move on to item number 19. Council member uh, from the fifth ward, sir, go ahead. Um, so this one, <clears throat> when I was reviewing the contract, uh, I know it's essential. This is basically an approval of Wi-Fi services, telecommunications for a lot of city operated buildings. But the one that I want clarification on, and I'd like to uh, direct staff maybe to look into this, is that it's proposed and naturally in the contract, uh, which I need to review myself. I want to look into potential for not having to pay for county fires Wi-Fi. They get all of our property tax already. It's not something personal, but they get tens of millions of dollars. And we're slated to basically pay seven thousand dollars a month for a, count, a county fire building, and I don't think that really makes sense. And so that's those are basically my thoughts. I'd like to direct city staff, uh, possible, to look into possibilities of retracting um, the obligation to have to provide Wi-Fi services to county fire, although it is in a city building, mm -hmm. if it's a possibility. All right, Mr. City Manager, can you help us out there on on um... Mr. Reynoso's request. Yes, we'll evaluate that. Before. If I can uh, clarify that the two locations that we use, we actually use those as city facilities as hop hopping points for connections to other city facilities. For example, our traffic network goes through one of the fire stations. And so we're using, basically we're borrowing their facilities to then provide service for us. The fire department is not using um, city facilities, they're not gaining a benefit for whether it's Wi-Fi or linked line or dedicated access. No, they're they're just being kind hosts for us to be able to drop a phone line in to then use to connect to other um, other city facilities. 
So, Mitch, we are paying seven thousand dollars for finish. Finish me up. We're paying seven thousand dollars a month. You know what? I'll wait for the report from Mr. Fields. Um, I'll wait for the. Well, it's closer to the the two thousand because the 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 amount of money that we're spending is across um, all twelve remote locations plus the local location which today we're spending $21,000 a month. We're dropping this with the new technology to go to 16,000 for a total monthly cost that covers all of the sites. So it's a lot closer to between one and 2,000 depending on which site. Okay. Well, okay, Mr. is Mr. there a motion Mr. manager? You're gonna get back to us, right? Yes. Thank you, sir. All right, motion and a second, please. I move. I second. All right, any objections? Item 19, none. Moving on. Um, this is item number 21. <laughs> Council member, you have it in succession 21, 22, 23, 24. Um, right. Let's see here. Are there any similar themes? Uh, the last two, 26 okay. and 27, but one through or 21 through 24 seem to all be related to PD. I just have, I just have questions. Okay, go time. ahead. Um, so number 21, uh, basically we would be authorizing the director of finance to issue a purchase order in amount of 75,000, um, for safety equipment, which I know is, is essential. Um, I just wanted to see if basically that price was potentially able to be lowered in any way. Anybody have the answer on this call? Chief McGrudge. Yes. Council member that uh, went out to a uh, request for, uh, proposals. So we did have several vendors that uh, put in bids for that. And this was the like, lowest vendor, lowest cost vendor. I was able to supply all the items on the list. <clears throat> I understand the, the equipment too that comes with that. Thank you for that. That's my only on 21. I move. Thank you, council hey. member. I was wondering if we were asleep here. All <laughs> right. Late, huh? uh, no. I'm just waiting on my council to get in action so we can come prepared to vote. Mayor, uh, we'll make the item second. number, uh, it's Damon, uh, council member Alexander, council member Sanchez. Are there any objections on 21? Seeing none, let's move on to item number 22, sir. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I have a question for you again, Chief McBride, uh, and also city manager, uh, if you could time on this. So I wanted to know, this is a grant. Um, I think it's a brilliant idea. I want to make that known upfront, a mobile application to report public safety issues. I think, I think it's brilliant. And I think we should have been ahead of that a long time ago. Uh, I just want to know what the financial impact will be beyond the grant life. And uh, if I could have a report, Chief McBride, to all of the council and the mayor, and maybe it'd be very public about where, because I understand it's about 630 to $40,000 for this particular grant. I want to know where the other 590,000 are going and uh, what the impact will be financially for the city beyond the grants life. Yeah, these are the, uh, the council member, thank you for the question. Um, this grant uh, was for one-time uh, expenditures. Um, obviously there is a initial cost not to exceed $40,000 for this mobile application. And I think <coughs> without looking at the report, the, um, the maintenance of that mobile app is several thousand dollars a year following that. So obviously that's something that when the, uh, the grant will fund that for the first year and it'll be us to pick up just the maintenance, which is very uh, marginal, so to speak. Um, but we've purchased uh, police vehicles uh, with that grant so far. Some of it has gone towards overtime. We have added some officers that have been off work due to COVID and we have to backfill. So this grant that's funding uh, this mobile app specifically is the uh, the COVID grant that we obtained that was about 600,000 to offset and mitigate the effects of uh, the COVID-19. And so specifically why we did the, uh, the mobile app is that we do have a web-based uh, report writing platform for the community to make police reports. But as you know, most people don't have desktops anymore. And when you try to bring a, a desktop-based program up on your phone, it doesn't really format that well. So we wanted to make it, the, the process simple and very easy and adaptive for people who want to make those police reports because we want to encourage that because of COVID, trying to limit the risk of contact between members of the community and the police department and vice versa uh, to reduce that exposure to COVID-19. 
And plus, this just makes a better efficiency for people to be able, in a lot of cases, people just want to make a report very quickly and be done with it. And this allows them to get that done without having to wait for a police officer. So yes, there will be a maintenance uh, that continues into the future for this. And it's roughly um, $9,000 a year um, following the initial uh, outlay for the, for the Thank you for that. I make a motion to approve. Oh, Second. thank you. Oh, thank yeah, funny guy. Thank you. No <laughs> objections? Attractive. No objections? Okay, hearing none, let's move on to item number 23. All right. Uh, Chief, what is the average salary for um, a San Marino police officer? Sworn? Average salary, um, fully benefited. The uh, the average cost of an officer is one hundred sixty one thousand dollars. That's top uh, step, and that's not just salary. That's benefits, uh, purse costs, and everything at the top step. Because the thing is, is we don't uh, price out our um, these these costs at the lowest level because uh, most of our officers do it pretty quickly get to a, a higher step. So we don't charge individuals or grants at the lowest cost we time at the very top. Okay. Yeah, well that pretty much answered my question because I saw the the chart with the four proposed positions, basically for like outskirt kind of surveillance for San Manuel. I just wanted to know if that was gonna kind of like mess with the culture of pay or anything, but you pretty much said no, it's not. Okay, thank you. Council members, uh, move, move for approval. Move. Second. Okay, any objections? Hearing none, moving on to 24. This is for Ca Council Member Calvin and uh, Council Member uh, <coughs> So My question was on the, uh, I, I saw that this grant will take care of uh, one sworn officer, one um, community engagement specialist, and one crime investigator. On the, on the uh, community engagement specialist, is that an officer or is it someone that we hire from the community itself? That the community off, the community engagement officer is a professional staff or civilian member of the police department that uh, engages in community outreach and community engagement, obviously. Uh, part of the, uh, the grant is education. So we need to do a lot of public outreach and that position actually um, will be engaging the community, putting out stuff on social media, putting out uh, um, hard material out to, to the schools and stuff like that to, mm. their, um, to interact with the uh, the juveniles, which is we're trying to counter juvenile tobacco use. Thank you. Motion for approval. I've got a comment. Right, um, yeah, I wanted to yeah. know this is a it's an annual grant, correct? So after this, we the city would be pulling out a general fund should you not get the tobacco grant again, correct? It. Uh, Thank you for that question. It actually is funding those positions for three years. So with any grant, um, once the grant funding expires, it's uh, you know the city council's uh, decision whether or not they want to continue those positions. Um, if not, then they fall off our table of organization and they're unfunded and they're eliminated. All right. Okay, uh, motion for approval, anybody? Who to approve? Second. Okay, any objections? Item 24. Hearing none, uh, item number 26. Calvin, we can clump 26. Uh, and Reynoso. Yeah. Oh, that go ahead. Like, yeah, we, we've got our, our, I've got my understanding on 26. It was, it was like the other ones. Okay. Uh, Likewise. Ben, all right, you're good. All right. Motion Put to approve. approve. Motion to approve. Great. Second. Second. Wonderful. Objections? Okay, none. 27, item uh, Ward 2 CFD. This is uh ben go ahead councilman please um the same though i i don't really have any more questions i understand uh cfds thank you alex for clarifying on the maintenance services as well um i want to echo what my fellow councilman uh teddy sanchez or councilman sanchez i'm sorry um was mentioning about sharing this with the public that people know if their territory is being annexed and what their tax burden will essentially be it's very important to me. 
Vote so I make a motion to approve. Second. Okay, and a second by Ted. Uh, thank you. Council members, um, any objections on item number 27? Hearing none. Okay, I think we're done with consent. Thank you, council members. Um, items to be considered. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Alexander, councilman, uh, go ahead, sir, on your item. On our, my item to be considered tonight. Uh, yeah, you have one um, regarding the commissions. Oh, the city manager and I, we uh, spoke on the commissions and we laid out a plan Okay. Uh, of when the commissions will commence. Uh, public, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Mr. City Manager, uh, public safety will start uh, meeting via Zoom in February. Uh, March, we will start we will start commissioned uh, parks and rec and April will be, uh, I believe animal, animal control. Yeah. Yes. Animal Art, control. Arts and historical preservation. Oh, what, so what is animal control? May. May. Okay. May. Yes. So we're bringing back all the commissions back online. Uh, working around this COVID situation because we are a major city and we should not be stymied by this. We have the technology. So um, we worked it out. Do I need a motion for that? No. Okay. You're good. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Alexander. Councilman Figueroa. Uh, thank you. Um, well, one of the issues, of course, uh, of course it goes without. Um, saying the this past year has been very difficult uh, regarding COVID and the pandemic. Um, one of the issues, of course, was that uh, that that has come to my attention is that in, in regards to, to permits uh, and individuals having plans that have been delayed, um, you know, and, and their permits have, have expired as, as a result of some of these delays. Um, I, I know, Mr. Mr. Huntley, I know your plate is very full right now, and so I'm going to of course, through the the city manager, if I if I may, uh, ask you to dig a, a little deeper here. I, I was wondering if we could have if the council could have some type of policy come back uh, to the council regarding some type of a pardon or amnesty program uh, for for those individuals who who were in the process of having some type of uh, plan or, or whose permits expired during this during this pandemic. Um, you know, there's there are a few things that the city can do. This would be one of them so that these individuals, these businesses don't have to, I guess, go through this whole process all over again uh, and not have to pay the city for something that they uh, already have. And so uh, just asking again uh, through the city manager, if the council can have some type of policy come back so that we can make that decision to provide or offer some type of pardon or, or, or amnesty rather for uh, for some of these issues. Certainly, Councilman. If I may just add to that. Oh, sorry, Rob. Go ahead. Okay, I, I was going to say, uh, Mike Huntley and I were just discussing this earlier today, uh, and we are formulating a plan to do exactly that. So um, we will work with the city attorney's office, and, uh, and apparently, the city attorney has something to say about this. But uh, yes, we are we are very much um, in the in the process of doing exactly that. So, uh, city attorney. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I just, just wanted to let you know there's actually a very easy way to do that through maybe an executive order. Some other cities have been using the city council's emergency declaration. So it may be something that staff can put into place um, and do it quickly without having to come back to council. I'll work with the staff. So this is the one time I offer an easy solution to make it quicker. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then just one more thing, if I may add just one more uh, one thing. Um, you know, one of, one of the most fundamental uh, things and basic functions of, of a local government uh, is to is that of providing or fixing streets, sidewalks, storm drains, and things like that. You know, uh, our CIP. Uh, and so I'm just asking if uh, if we may be able to have a a mid year review type of audit for of our CIP uh, to see what's been completed, what's in process, uh, what is not yet started. I, I want to make sure that we keep on schedule. With, with our CIP and not have any of it roll over into to the next year. So if uh, 
in the near future or some sometime soon if we, we would be able to be pro provided an update regarding our CIP. Uh, certainly, yes, um, Councilman, thank you for the question. Uh, we have on February 17th, we've, we've moved the mid-year budget report up a month. Usually it's in March, but uh, there are so many things going on right now that <clears throat> it's time for us to have additional discussions about the budget and we are going to bring a CIP report to the council at the same time. So look for that on February 17th. Thank you, and that's all. Thank you, thank you all. Honestly, thank you to all of you for all the hard work. It has definitely been a very difficult year. So truly, uh, genuinely thankful for all the hard work that has gone in to all of you. Thank you. Councilman Reynoso. Um, I wanted to see if we could assist our city clerk. I've been working uh, with her. I appreciate it on making public comment digital and streamlined. And so she'll do what she can, but I would like to know uh, if she has kind of like some financial assistance that's needed to make not only it streamlined so it's accessible on a cell phone doesn't have to be an application uh for reference the county at the beginning of the pandemic had it like two clicks i could leave a public comment for anything and so that was that's ideal people can't meet in person we need to make it accessible and beyond that i would like to look uh if you could if staff could um create a report on how much it would cost to create regular Spanish translation and potentially Vietnamese to encompass our entire community for these meetings. We should be having Spanish translation live and active right now. And that's it. If you could come back with something, how much that's going to cost or if it can be an agenda item, I look forward to that. Okay, thank you, Councilman. And Councilmember Barra? Mayor Pro Temp, Mayor, please. Go ahead, ma'am. So um, I want to ask further uh, for city manager, why are we holding off on those commission meetings months apart? Um, Zoom calls can be made at any time. I'm, I'm just curious why we're, we're facing them out when we're supposed to be doing them via Zoom, not in person. Um, if there are a couple issues, a, lot, a couple of, especially related to COVID. Uh, we have had, um, I'm not going to get into detail, but we've had several departments that have been significantly impacted by uh, COVID and uh, in illness related absences it makes it very difficult for some of these smaller departments to um, pre to pre present to prepare and present an agenda for a commission meeting. These are fairly significant. These are significant endeavors. Uh, we also have to attack some technology limitations at the moment, which we are also working through. So uh, basically, and we uh, we have had a couple of fairly extensive discussions about this. Um, it is not even not easy a uh, task to accomplish to stand these back up, but we are um, we've heard the council and we are in the process of reestablishing that schedule and conducting those uh, commission meetings. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem and Council members. Tonight, uh, we've had a, a, a lot of good agenda items move forward on policy. Again, thank you. Happy New Year to all of our um, city staff members and our community. Yeah, Council Member Kelvin. Sorry, go ahead, ma'am. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, I would like uh, for future meetings to consider us giving our city COVID update. I know that we do post things online, but not all members of our community utilize the internet, especially our seniors. And if we could um, give the city's update as well, not just the county. And also as um, we should also look into American Sign Language as well for our meetings as well, so that we can talk to all of our community, our community meetings, uh, community members. And bring back community um, announcements. We used to make those beginning of the sessions we need to bring those back okay uh, thank you council member um happy new year everybody staff members thank you for uh, tonight great great policy moves on our city's part we thank our city staff and we want to say thank you again to our uh, viewing audience thank you for your patience tonight we've had some uh minor glitches here with our uh, technical uh, it department but uh, we're getting through it. We thank you again, once again, and um, happy new year. This concludes our meeting tonight. Thank you.